Well, hello kitties. Here we are again with another teeny tiny technical, well, it's not an instruction, it's a construction adventure. Um, I've decided I wanted to do a kayak. I'll kind of explain why as I go through here. So this is the part one of my uh, very first uh, skin on frame kayak construction adventure. Um, I'm going to do a prototype here. Why did I do this? Well, uh, the impetus of the idea is uh, that I wanted to combine a woodworking project and uh, some way to do some upper body exercises that are not so boring because I have uh, a gym at home and a treadmill and here it is right here. Actually, I'm getting ready to put this up on uh, Craigslist or some, something to sell this. Uh, I belong to a um, health club, which I seldom ever use. And uh, I do have uh, all this stuff out here in my garage, which I also seldom ever use because it is incredibly boring. Um, I do a lot of uh, lower body exercise in the sense of uh, riding my bike. I do usually three days a week with a bunch of other old geezers. We usually do a 40 or 50 three days a week. So uh, when I don't do that, I go out and uh, jog in the um, hinderlands around my house here. So. I get a lot of cardio, but I don't get any upper body, so I happened to see a thing up on the web about uh, building your own uh, kayak, and I got very interested, because I like to do woodworking too, have been doing it for many years, so that was kind of where I was going with this. Uh, I wanted something that would let me do some upper body that was more entertaining than sitting out here lifting weights and you know, listening to the radio. So first I had to select a building method and there are a number of different ways to do this if you uh, do some investigation on building your own kayak. There are the stripper methods which is what I really really like but um, having never built one of these before this is a major undertaking hundreds and hundreds of hours to do it this way a bunch of little strips of wood that are all glued together and then uh, massive amounts of fiberglass work uh, so I said well I'm not even close to being ready for that um, then there's a simpler way called a stitch and glue which is a bunch of panels that you stitch together with some wire and then glue it all up that also requires a massive amount of uh, fiberglass work and then there's the simplest one the skin on frame um, and that's the one I decided to do because it's pretty straightforward uh, in terms of um, putting the frame together and then covering it over with some kind of material. Um, so it seemed like that would be the simplest one for me to tackle first. So that's kind of where I went with this. Uh, and uh, the skin on frame one, the, the one that I really want to do uh, on my um, completed one, not this prototype that I'm going to show you I'm doing now, is to use a clear vinyl um, skin over top of the woodworking frame because I was really interested in the it's incredible work, woodworking that uh, you can do in building these frames. So the first thing to do was uh, to loft a full size um, drawings of the uh, cross sections that hold all of the little strips together here. Uh, loft is just a fancy word for make the drawings full size. I guess that comes from the fact that in the old days they used to have like a loft where the boat builders would make the drawings. At least that's uh, the information I've been able to find out. Certainly when you start uh, working on this, if you have no experience with boats, the terminology can be a bit confusing. It took me quite a while to just figure out what people were talking about um, in terms of lofting and you know, gunnels and chines. Uh, good grief, I had no idea what any of that stuff was. So the first thing I did was uh, draw some full-size plans up here and I spent many, many days researching these designs and learning the ter uh, terminology. So I used um, very large sheets of um, watercolor paper because it's very heavy. It's, it's almost like cardboard um, because I knew I'd be messing with these a lot. So I needed something that would allow me to do lots of changes and stuff on, on the drawing. So I did full-size drawings up on my drafting table so I would have something to work with. Right? Then I transferred those over to pieces of cardboard because I n had no idea what this thing was supposed to look like or how big it was going to be in, in real life. 
I mean, you can look at drawings, but uh, until you kind of lay this out, you don't have any idea how big this thing is. So I transferred half of the cross sections to these cardboards. You can see I've drawn just half of it, not the full thing here. And then cut it out using my little um, scroll saw. Then I took the pieces and I laid them down on the floor in my little uh, one-car garage um, to be, get an idea how big this thing really would be. So then I set it up using a tape measure for the uh, specifications for the distances uh, between these cross sections that are going to hold these uh, chines, these, these uh, wooden strips here in these notches in order to figure out at least how big this thing might be because it said it was supposed to be around 13 or 14 feet so I laid it out to get some idea how big I was really after how big the cockpit would be where you sit in because the last thing I want to do being an absolute neophyte is get into a kayak that's designed to fit like a glove I need to be able to get out of this thing so I needed to have at least some idea how much room I had to sit in this thing so I could figure out if I could get in and out of it very quickly. Now some of you who are very experienced in these kind of things are thinking what kind of a lunatic would build a boat he'd never been in before and has no idea what he's doing. Well you're listening to one now. So the next thing I need to do after I've figured out uh, the drawings and uh, figured out how big this thing would be paste it up on the floor is how much material should I get and I wanted to use the cheapest stuff I could fine because I'm building a prototype here I expect to make a lot of mistakes and have discovered that I have so um, I did the, the drawings and figured this whole thing out I took uh, the uh, actual cutouts of the drawings that I had and I just kind of squared them off uh, full size once again and then kind of messed around here on my drafting table to figure out how much wood should I have to get because the, the um, kind of partial instructions I have said you're going to use half inch plywood. I've discovered I think when I build the real one I'm going to use three quarter inch plywood but in any case I needed to know how much uh, big of a sheet of plywood I'd need so I laid it out here and figured out I needed a half a sheet of plywood a four by four. <clears throat> so I went down to the local hardware store Lowe's Improvement there and I bought a half sheet of uh, half inch plywood and the cheapest thing I could find were these um, things that are called furring strips and they're just really cheap pine with lots of knots and stuff in it but I bought two uh, bundles of these things and you can see I've got one two three four eight nine ten eleven twelve so I got twenty four of these things two bundles but they're only eight feet long so that presented a bit of an issue right there I'm gonna have to glue a bunch of them together uh, I bought a box of screws and some uh, Gorilla Glue and it came to a total of, let's see, uh, $62.07. So that's how much money I got into this thing so far to build this prototype. Alright, the next thing I did was I took my full size drawings and I laid them out on the uh, plywood sheet right there and using a very, very sharp ice pick I transferred um, all of the position lines you know by making a little dent through the drawing onto the plywood and then use just a pencil to draw you know connect the dots like that so I could transfer the drawing over to the plywood sheet. The next thing I did was uh, use my uh, saber saw here to uh, rough out just around the outline uh, of all the pieces so then I've got them kind of stacked up over here. Now comes a, a bit of the tricky part depending on how neat you want to be is you have to cut these out along the straight lines and you know along the straight lines and cut out the uh, in the cut out the cutouts right here now I would strongly suggest if you don't have all the woodworking tools that I have that you uh, invest in a, a couple of decent uh, pole saws they sometimes called Japanese saws I have several of them here they cut on the pole um, this is very typical of jewelry. If you do jewelry work, you'll very, be very familiar. It's a lot more accurate to be able to pull the blade than it is to push it. Uh, discovered that over the years many times myself. So I, I would suggest if you're going to do this by hand, which is a very time-consuming process, that you invest in a couple of decent pull saws. Different uh, uh, numbers of teeth right there. Now I, because I used to have a woodworking shop, have tons of tools over in storage. So I went over in storage and got my uh, bandsaw 
<clears throat> and the reason I decided to use the bandsaw is it's one easy for me to move my table saws are so heavy I can't move them by myself so I just brought my bandsaw over to my little garage so I could be more efficient cut these out much more quickly you can certainly do it by hand but it's going to take you a long time the next thing is you need to cut out the inside now if you're using a saber saw there's a problem with that uh, when you're cutting plywood you need a really really fine blade or on the upstroke of the uh, blade it'll tear out the uh, surface of the plywood so um, in my case I was using a bandsaw and you can still see a little bit of a tear out on here uh, from the bandsaw and I was using a pretty fine blade too but the inside's a bit trickier so you need to uh, establish a hole I used uh, Forsner bits I have a whole set of those to establish a hole um, so that you could put uh, like a coping saw or using once again your your uh, electric saber saw but once again you're going to have a problem with tear out so being a whiz bang engineering kind of guy I am I thought hey there's an easier way to do this using my bandsaw just cut through here that gets you inside and then you can cut it out much more quickly and much more efficiently my advice is after doing this don't do it this way because I had to put a little strip in here and glue it back together you can see it right here and uh, further on in some other steps I discovered this is not nearly strong enough and I had to come back in here and put uh, braces across here so don't do it this way I will not do it this way again the next step was uh, because of the dimensions of the um, pieces that are going to go in here these these furring strips were too wide so I had to rip all of them in order to get them down to the correct width now that presents its own problem because then you have to scarf two of the pieces together in order to make a piece that in this case are going to be 16 feet long so to do this by hand is major time consumption so if you don't have some way to do this efficiently I'd suggest you just make sure you get 16 foot long pieces although that presents a problem in itself too so anyway I scarfed the pieces that I needed to uh, using my bandsaw but that leaves a really rough edge which does not glue well so once again I have lots of tools I set up my a belt sander here uh, reciprocating oscillating belt sander um, so that it would form a wedge right here so that I could get the really rough surface right here cut on the bandsaw to a really smooth surface that would glue up all right then I took a long piece of two before and stuck it in the vise because I've got two eight foot pieces here that are very hard to manage without some kind of support so here's the two scarfs you can see right here in the magic gorilla glue alright so then you just put them together you slide them together but uh, you have to make sure that you don't push them too far or it gets too thick here and if you don't push them far enough it's too thin so they have to match and that's why you use kind of a gauge so you gauge the thickness over here and then stick it over here and slide these around until it comes up to the same thickness then you can glue them together now I also discovered that when you glue them together and you you clamp them here You'll, you'll hear this over and over again from woodworkers you can never have enough clamps but when you clamp them together um, they'll hold as long as they're supported but as soon as you pull this off these two clamps will not be strong enough no matter how you tighten it it will not be strong enough this this joint will kind of slip around so what I did was I drilled a hole kind of toward the end of each of the scarfs and uh, stuck a um, um, some uh, dowel through here so that it glues up and that way you can take this off without this thing sliding around so then you can work on a whole bunch of these at one time you can glue them up all, all at the same time the next thing you need to do is build what they call a strong back which is really just a support mechanism and I used a, a long 2 by 4 and figured out hey this is a really easy way to do it I have some angle iron so I just uh, established the angle iron and used a square to uh, straighten it so it would be you know perpendicular to the length of the uh, strong back or in this case just a 2 by 4 uh, most of the instructions will tell you to build a strong back much much stronger than the one I did but uh, hey this is the material I had and I didn't want to buy anything else so that way then I can mount the uh, cross uh, sections here to the to these um, uh, angle irons and I used I don't know if you can tell right here but I used this little 
a marking device to establish a line all the way down the um, strong back so that I had an edge right here to line it up so that everything stayed in the same uh, alignment. You also notice I've got the little glue thing right there where I glued it back together. Don't do it that way. So then that allowed me using this strong back to um, bolt the three sections because this is a five cross section uh, design right here. So I bolted those up so they're parallel or they're um, exactly lined up to each other. And then I could temporarily put the, the gunnel boards on here. These are not the real ones because they're too short, but uh, using tie wraps so I could kind of figure out where things are going to go. And I made a big change between here and here from the original specifications because, once again, I want this thing big enough so I can get my uh, ancient old carcass out of this thing if it happens to turn over. I may change that again later on, too. All right, so then that let me um, start putting the other pieces on. Now you notice that my strong back is not holding this front piece and it also doesn't hold the back piece. So I was using just uh, measurements to make sure that I was um, the same distance from here to here as from here to here. All right, so as I'm fitting these things, I'm kind of figuring stuff out as I go along. Alright, here's a bit of better picture as I've uh, actually screwed these in now to the uh, cross braces, cross sections that are attached to the strong back, but up here in the front I've just got them tie wrapped so I can kind of figure out where things go. And here's a close up of the screws. I'm not going to take these out. Uh, when I finally get around to building the correct one, I'll pull the screws and dowel this stuff in here so I won't have any metal. But in this one, the prototype doesn't really matter. And you also notice I made absolutely no effort to clean up any of these boards here, these chines. You can see the cut marks from the um, bandsaw. And here's a picture of a little bit more detail on what's going on here as I put the, a number of the chines in here. You can see a clamp holding it in right here so I could uh, eventually get to the point where I could get this really parallel by locking in uh, a number of these uh, chines in the gunnels. This was by far the trickiest part is trying to figure out on the bow and the stern how to cut this angle so that it meets the, the, the a piece that you have to put in here in the front and the back. I monkeyed with this a lot uh, to try to figure out the best way to do it. And I've pretty much come to the conclusion after getting this one here, you can see I haven't even cut these here yet, is uh, you just have to eyeball this. You just got to mess with it, mess with it, mess with it. And because I was using very soft material, uh, I finally determined that you make a rough cut using one of your uh, uh, Japanese saws and then I used a disc sander and just put the piece up here sanded it uh, that is put it up marked it a little bit pulled it away sanded it put it back up mark it a little bit pull it away sand it until I get the correct angle because these pieces as they come around here have a compound bend they have to bend around but they also twist you can see how these have a different amount of twist as they come out of this piece over here. So this is really tricky. There's no way to really measure it or set it up. You just have to keep fitting it. And then the back, I made some modifications here too. This will be eventually be the backrest right here, but I used uh, three uh, support braces here. And you can see that the stern over here, I haven't done much of anything except get that uh, the gunnels attached. Yeah, here's a close-up of it right here. I still haven't cut these as of today. I'll be out there doing that today. So far I estimate about 20 hours to get this far, starting from the lofting step. Not uh, none of the research I did. I spent hours and hours and hours doing the research in order to determine this, this particular model was the one I wanted to build. So, how far is it going to take me? Another maybe 20 hours at least to get to the finish of the prototype, I'm sure. I'll make a lot of changes in the good model based on what I'm learning about the many mistakes I've discovered so far. I'm going to do this uh, quite a bit differently when I do the real one because uh, I have a lot of money in the materials and I don't want to mess that up. So there you go. 
look for part number two coming to you soon.